Okay class, we are finally going to be doing some brain videos. So this is the first one. I wanted to kind of pick up where we left off with the last video. This was the autopsy um, that I showed you I showed you in the last video in, in, when they were removing the brain from the cranial cavity and they had cut the falx cerebri. So this is, they'd cut the falx right here and that allowed the the brain to be removed from the cranial cavity it freed it here's the falx down here so this is our frontal lobe down through here you can see this is the the front uh, frontal bone with the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone there remember the falx is attaching to the crystagalli of the ethmoid bone so this is the frontal bone this is front this is front. So let's get started with our brain. So there's four major parts of the, the brain. Today we're only going to be doing the cerebrum and hopefully we'll do the, the other three parts tomorrow. The cerebrum, when you think of the brain, that is what you are thinking of. This area in gold here that has all these bumps and crevices this is the cerebrum so this whole part is the cerebrum here they did a mid sagittal cut so you're seeing one cerebral hemisphere here and it's it's this whole light colored part except for the cerebellum but everything else is the cerebrum everything that has these bumps and lumps on it and including the corpus callosum that we've talked about the communication white track that allows the right and left hemisphere to talk to each other and we're going to have our uh, lateral ventricles that are in each of our cerebral hemispheres deep within the brain are going to be these midline structures that we'll get to this is the diencephalon this purple part here is the cerebellum and then the brain stem so we will look at those separately and I just wanted to show you how the brain is actually fitting in the cranial cavity. I just showed you that picture of the autopsy where we saw um, the frontal lobe was within the anterior cranial fossa here. And here is the, the crystagalli of the ethmoid bone that was holding that falx cerebri right in the midline. The middle cranial fossa, that is where your temporal lobe of your brain's going to be sitting right over the temporal bone and here is the cerebellum the little brain is going to be sitting down in down in this posterior cranial fossa so we're going to be doing the cerebrum so like i said when you think of the the brain this is what you are thinking of and it makes up about 80 percent of the mass of the brain this is the part of your brain that is making you higher mental functions, the ability to have memories, reason, figure things out, language. Those are all in the cerebrum. Now, there, um, we have the right, the left and right cerebral hemispheres that are going to be separated by this deep, deep fissure called the longitudinal fissure. So make sure you know this fissure that's on your master list and the um, the transverse fissure which is separating the back of the brain, the occipital lobes from the cerebellum. That's going to be the transverse fissure. What part of the dura sits in here? Remember your tentorium cerebelli will sit in here? And your falx cerebri will sit in here, part of the dura folds, right? We already talked about this before, and we'll talk about it again, and we'll talk about it again later too today. But remember, the the left and right cerebral hemispheres are held together by that corpus callosum, all important close corpus callosum. Now, they communicate with each other through that corpus callosum, 
but they are very different thinking brains. Your left side of the brain is your analytical brain. You're, it's doing reasoning, putting things in order, um, making sure you, you go to the doctor's appointment that you have or that you have a, an exam next week. Those are all left-sided brain activities. And the left side of the brain is your language brain with there are are certain areas in your left brain that allow you to speak that the language uh, um to speak words and to understand words so dr jill bolte when you saw her her talking about her stroke she had a huge left-sided brain bleed that affected her left brain she was no longer to speak and she was no longer able to understand language so that is why the left brain the left hemisphere is so important the right hemisphere is more of your creative imagination artistic um, brain but we need we need both they need to be in balance with each other and there are cases where they will actually sever. They will cut this corpus callosum. Um, for people that have severe seizures, and those seizures will, will transfer from one brain to the other through that corpus callosum, and their seizures are so bad, they will actually cut the corpus callosum. And you can go on YouTube and see videos on split brain syndrome. What happens when that corpus callosum is cut it's kind of strange one side of the brain has no clue what the other side of the brain is actually doing so we i like this picture just because it kind of shows you the left brain being organized methodical logical and here is our right brain being free of the stresses of life and not worrying about anything and here's our corpus callosum collect, co connecting those two and hopefully they will work together and come up with a good solution for you so the surface of the cerebrum when you look at the cerebrum this is what you're seeing all these bumps we are now going to give these little lumps and bumps names this this ridge is called a gyri these are all gyri, these ridges. Gyrus is one single ridge, but these are a bunch of gyri, all these ridges. Now, the grooves, the depressions are going to be the sulci. So lots of gyri and sulci. So we've got our one sulcus, sulcus is singular, one gyrus, singular, another sulcus, why might we want this on our cerebrum? What is this giving us? In anatomy, that is more surface area. More surface area for what? We'll talk about that shortly. Now, there are certain sulci and gyri you have to know. So if you need to make index cards for these, go ahead. The first sulci guy you need to know is the central sulcus now here is the superior view of the the brain this central sulcus is coming across here this groove is going across both hemispheres this is the central sulcus and this central sulcus separates the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes central sulcus and then you're going to have on the lateral view you're going to have a lateral sulcus. Now this lateral sulcus is separating the temporal lobe from your frontal and parietal lobes. Some places will call this a lateral fissure because it is kind of, it's a little bit deeper than a sulcus, but either one is fine. And the gyri you need to know, there's two of them. You have a pre-central gyrus pre means in front of in front of the central sulcus this gyrus is right here 
It's a prefrontal gyrus. It is just this one singular gyrus right in front of the central sulcus that's in the frontal brain. This is important because this is this pre-central gyrus controls all your somatic motor. All your skeletal muscles are controlled by this gyrus, this pre-central gyrus. And then you're going to have a post-central gyrus, a gyrus that's behind the central sulcus. Here it is. It's in the parietal lobe. And this post-central sulcus, post-central sulcus, this post-central gyrus is controlling all your somatic sensation, that sensation coming from your skin, touch, pain, temperature, vibration. That is going to be processed by the post-central gyrus. I just wanted to show you this because on a, on a brain, you can actually see that central sulcus pretty easily. So here's a brain. This is the front. This is the back. Here is the central sulcus. It just kind of goes right across onto the other side. That is way cool. Just wanted to show you that. Now, the cerebrum, we're still in the cerebrum has three regions. Each hemisphere has three regions. So we're going to go through those three regions now. The first region is the cerebral cortex. That is the outer layer. It's all gray matter. So this, this ribbon of gray matter is the cerebral cortex. And it's only two to four millimeters deep. That is all gray matter, but it makes up 40% of your total brain mass. How is that possible? Because of all those sulci and gyri, we've now increased the surface area. And who lives in this gray matter? Gray matter is a collection of cell bodies these are interneurons. These are the guys that are doing everything for you. Interneurons and lots of billions of interneurons in this cerebral cortex. So just some interesting facts. This cerebral cortex, this is the main processing center of your brain. All that information that's being sent up to your brain for processing, this is where it's being processed. Once they figure out what to do, it's coming down from the cerebral cortex. This cerebral cortex allows you to have what is called the conscious mind. That's a whole nother topic. What does it mean to be conscious, to be aware of your surroundings, of your environment? It's of the cerebral cortex is only gray matter, only gray matter, billions of interneurons. And I wanted to make sure we, we talked about the precentral um, gyrus that was our motor co cortex and the postcentral gyrus that was our sensory, somatic sensory cortex. Don't confuse sensory and motor areas of the cortex with sensory and motor neurons. All the neurons in the cortex are interneurons. Where do sensory neurons live? The ones we've talked about in the dorsal root ganglion. Yes, they're in the PNS. Where are motor neurons? They are in the gray matter of the spinal cord. So everything in the gray matter here, they're all interneurons. Each interneuron can talk to thousands and thousands of other interneurons all at the same time. So let's look at our lobes and what they actually are doing. 
So let's start with the frontal lobe. So we said the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So this is our frontal lobe. It is our biggest lobe. When you think of personality, um, higher cognitive function, thinking and reasoning, this is the frontal lobe. And it also includes that precentral gyrus that is controlling your skeletal muscles. And on the left lobe, on the left hemisphere of the frontal lobe only, you're going to have Broca's area. So Broca's area is your motor for speech, your ability to form words and actually make speech. That is Broca's area. It's in the frontal lobe only, only in the left hemisphere. And then the parietal lobe. This is basically, think of your parietal lobe as your sensory cortex. We already talked about the pre, the, the pre, the post central gyrus. This is somatic sensory interpretation up in here. So this is all the sensation coming from the skin receptors, um, touch, temperature, pain, and, and pressure. So that is, think of parietal lobe sensory interpretation. Occipital lobe, this is pretty easy. Easy. This is the visual cortex. This is interpreting visual stimuli. And then we get to the temporal lobe. So we have, they call it the auditory cortex. So it's your primary auditory hearing and olfactory smelling cortex. So you hear and smell because it's interpreting it in, in this temporal lobe. And it's the storage of auditory and olfactory memories. What does that mean? Say you hear a fire, a fire alarm go off. You know what it is because you've heard it in the past and it's in your mind. As soon as you hear it, you know it's a fire alarm. Or you smell some, you smell smoke. You go, hmm, something must be burning because you've smelled that before. And it's other things too, like it smells like it's going to rain. Or you can, you remember the smell of how your, your first boyfriend or girlfriend in, in high school smelled like you remember their smell. Those are all auditory and olfactory memories that are stored away in the temporal lobe. Now we're just going to look at the, the pre-central gyrus, the motor, the motor area in our frontal lobe. This is just showing you the amount of real estate, how many interneurons are involved with different parts of your skeletal muscle. So, so oh, here's your, your foot, not too much on the, look at this, knee, hip, trunk, shoulder, arm, not that much, but wow, once it gets up to the hand, the hand is pretty small, but it's getting a lot of real estate up here. Then you get to the face, lots of real estate um, to move all the muscles, control all the muscles on the face facial muscles, eye muscles, lip muscles, tongue, everything, a lot of real estate. And then this is the post-central gyrus. So this is the amount of real estate that's going to be used to interpret sensation, somatic sensation. Again, same thing. Foot, not too much. You're getting more with the, the hand because there's lots more sensation coming in through your your fingers, really sensitive. And then, of course, the big face. The face is very sensitive. Lips, very sensitive. Look how much your inner abdominal organs are getting. Not much at all. That's why abdominal pain is kind of, you can't really figure out where it's coming from. It's not real, it's not a real clear pain. But, then you get to this, the foot and the genitalia. Now, Dr. Matz clued me in onto this. He goes, this is why some people actually have foot fetishes. The foot 
and the, the genitalia, the sensation to the foot and the genitalia are so close in this post-central gyrus that there is going to be some crossover, or there could be, there could be some crossover. So when you get sensation of the foot, you're getting sensation of the genitalia. So this is why some people have that foot fetish right there. These are just the, um, they call them the motor and sensory homunculus. This is just showing you if you built a person based on how much of your brain was devoted to certain parts of the, your, your body, this is what your motor would look like, and this is what your sensory would look like. Kind of goes along with those, um, the, the diagrams I just showed you, but they're kind of funny looking. So we finished with that cerebral cortex. Now we're going to go on to the cerebral white matter. So here is another um, transverse cut. Here is the front. Here is the front. And here is the back. So this is occipital back here. Here's the frontal lobes back up here. We've already seen the, the gray matter, the cerebral cortex. Now we're going to talk about this white matter. These white matter, there's lots of cerebral white matter, and there's three different types of white, white matter or white fiber tracks. And these, these white matter tracks are forming billions of connections within the, the brain. They are transferring information through these myelinated um, tracks. So why is it white again? Because they're myelinated, myelin is white. So we're going to start with our commissural fibers first. You already know this one, the corpus callosum. Commissural means um, joining together in some fashion. So that is what the corpus callosum does. It is joining the right and left cerebral hemispheres together. It allows them to share information from one side of the brain to the other. So you've seen it here. This is a cool dissection where you can see the corpus callosum, but they have dissected out all those myelinated axons. So you can see these large tracks going into the cerebral cortex, sending information between the two cerebral hemispheres back and forth. This is an amazing dissection right there to see those white, white matter tracks. So that is the corpus callosum, your largest commissural fiber tract. Now we get to association white fiber tracts. These are found only in the same hemisphere. So if this was the right hemisphere, these association fiber tracts are only talking to interneurons within that same hemisphere. They are not sharing any of the information that they may be communicating about with the left hemisphere. So here's a dissection here. They're showing you them here, but here is the actual dissection. So here is the, where there, these, these tracks are going in this direction. These are all association tracks. They're coming from, here's the occipital lobe back in here, and they're coming all the way around up to the front. So they are sharing information with each other here. You can see some of them curving into here. Some of them are going in and sharing information up and through here. So this is way cool. So association tracks, they are only sharing information within their respective hemisphere. Hemisphere, did not spell that right, hemisphere. Now, the last type of white fiber tracks 
are the projection fibers. You've, we've actually talked about these before. You just didn't have a name for them. Remember we talked about the descending motor tracks that are coming from the cerebral cortex and going back down into the spinal cord to send out a command from the spinal cord to the spinal nerves. So that's a projection track. Those descending motor tracks that are coming down, transmitting those impulses down the cerebral cortex, down into the spinal cord. So this green is showing you those projection tracks. This is the descending motor tracks. And they're also um, the projection fibers are also the ascending sensory tracks that are coming up from the spinal cord and going to the cerebral cortex. So the green hair, these are projection fibers sending information down. Here's the midbrain, and then it's going to go down into the spinal cord and sending information up. What you need to know also is there is, there's a space in the white matter called the internal capsule. And this internal capsule is this space in between. This is gray matter here. This is all gray matter. So to get up from the spinal cord and up in through the cerebrum, we have to go through these, these um, deep, gray matter patches that we have in our brain, in our cerebrum. And that white area where they go through, where they travel, that is called the internal capsule. So you have an internal capsule here, an internal capsule here. So the internal capsule is the white matter in between these gray matter pockets where these projection fibers are traveling. They are going through into that internal capsule. Hopefully that makes sense. And this is actually showing to you here. Here is a commissural tract, this blue one. This is actually the corpus callosum because this is a coronal view. So you're seeing the corpus callosum cut in a different way, but this is the corpus callosum. White matter tracts going between the two um, cerebral hemispheres. Here's another view of the internal capsule. Here's a transverse cut showing you they're cutting it right through here. Here's, here's the, the fat of the eyeballs. Here's the frontal lobe, occipital lobe. So these, these gray matter collections here, we're going to talk about them shortly. This is the basal nuclei. This is big gray matter deep within the brain. And this is the thalamus, which is part of the diencephalon that we're going to get to next. But we have to get our projection fibers through all this white matter, and we got to go through these basal nuclei. We have to go through this white area called the internal capsule. So projection fibers going through the internal capsule here, projection fibers going through the internal capsule here. So they're going, sending inf sensory information down and motor, excuse me, sensory information up, motor information down through these white spaces called the internal capsule. They run through the gray matter deep within the brain. So hopefully that's easy to see there. Now this is a dissection of projection fibers. Th this is beautiful. You can see the fibers, these heavenly, heavenly, heavily myelinated fibers going up into the cerebral cortex. Here is the cerebral cortex, this thin little part up here. These are all the myelinated um, projection fibers going to and from the cerebral cortex. This is beautiful. Here is the internal capsule that's 
small little area where they're here's showing you the midbrain um, maybe this is the pons right here I can't really tell but they're coming up through here and here's going to be the internal capsule this space right in here and then they're going to send out those projection fibers into the cerebral cortex way cool this is actually uh, um, made by an artist Greg Dunn design you could check his work out beautiful you know I love Alex Gray this guy's work is also based on anatomy once you understand anatomy you know how amazing it is look at his interpretation of those projection fibers these are all projection fibers going to what's this the cerebral cortex this is beautiful he's got the little cerebellum down and through here beautiful beautiful work now the last part of our cerebrum remember we said we had the cerebrum had three parts cerebral cortex gone through that you know that cerebral white matter and you know that the three different types make sure you know them and what they look like done that now we're going to go on to these basal nuclei first what does a nucleus mean singular and nuclei plural mean remember your terms they it's a collection of cell bodies within the cns a collection of cell bodies in the cns this is gray matter gray matter lots of interneurons in here where i have the x's are the basal nuclei this is the thalamus not part of the basal nuclei these are the basal nuclei and there's actually three of them i'm not gonna for this semester i'm not gonna have you know those just know where they are and that that internal capsule is going through those basal nuclei what's in the internal capsule the projection fibers are traveling through that internal capsule but these are the basal nuclei a big collection of cell bodies so they must be important what do they do here's another view here we have a mid sagittal cut here and then we have a coronal cut here so you can kind of get more of a 3d view these light blue guys there's three of them these are the basal nuclei these are the basal nuclei and this is showing you the internal capsule going through them where those projection fibers are going through so 3d view because they're kind of hard to visualize but what do they do they are the subconscious control and massive integration of all your skeletal muscle movements so they're nice and fluid they are not herky jerky they're inhibiting any unnecessary movements and when you have something go going wrong with them the two major clinical things that go wrong with nasal nu um, basal nuclei you're going to see that in huntington's chorea and parkinson's disease I'm sure you've seen Michael J. Fox with Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, and he has those kind of herky jerky type of movements. Huntington's, it's, it's genetic. So if you get, have the genes for Huntington's, number one, you will get it, and number two, you will die. And it's just a slow degeneration of the neurons in the basal nuclei. So I wanted to show you a little video on just what Huntington's looks like so you can understand how important these basal nuclear nuclei actually are. And your mum would cry if someone stole you, wouldn't she? How would she cry? <laughs> For years, Rachel refused to accept she had Huntington's. It's an enriching movement, and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. 
Rachel has been sucked out of this body. She's disappearing, has disappeared over over all those 16 odd years. So I hope you have a better appreciation of the cerebrum. And then the next video, we're going to go on into the diencephalon and hopefully the brainstem and cerebellum also.